Um, before I start on these notes, though, let me just do a quick review of the three the three formulas you have to be comfortable with and the other types of conversions I need to be able to do. So maybe just off to the side before I cover this. One of the formulas you need to know is Boyle's Law, which is that P1V1 equals a constant. That's technically what Boyle's Law was, but we've kind of adapted Boyle's Law and we said that pressure one, volume one equals pressure two, volume two. You guys are all fairly familiar with that formula and you can, you can use it. Okay. Uh, second law was Charles' law. His law was that volume over temperature is also equal to a constant. Uh, we've since adapted that and made a formula out of it that says that volume one, temperature one, equals volume two, temperature two. I'm going to put just a little star next to this. Um, this one's tricky for a couple of reasons. You need to make sure, for one, that you know how to deal with fractions. So that does involve like maybe like cross multiplying things. Make sure that you understand the math behind how to do that. Um, I've taught pretty much all of you guys math to some degree here. Exact, exact. I've talked with you. You seem to get this. So. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is it has to be in kelvins. If you don't put temperature in kelvins, this does not work. The rationale behind that is that a kelvin scale technically starts at zero and works its way up, which is actually quite logical in science. Because you shouldn't be able to have negative temperature. When we teach little kids temperature, I think it makes sense to them that negative numbers are below zero for freezing. But like, you really can't have negative heat, right? You have either no heat, which is absolute zero, which is not even possible, and then you have more and more heat from there. So, anyways, make sure you use calculus. And then uh, last formula is the combined gas law. You'll recognize this one because I'm going to give you a lot of numbers. And so long as you've got good math algebraic skills, those ones are fairly straightforward usually. So, uh, that's a good chunk of what you need to be able to do. Uh, another set of stuff you have to be able to do is unit conversions. So that would be, you need to know that in one atmosphere, there are 760 millimeters of mercury, and that there are 101.325 kilopascals. You should know the unit type stuff. You should also know how to convert Kelvin into degrees Celsius. That's another skill you should have. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, one more thing you should know is uh, what STP and SATP are. I haven't used it much yet. Do you guys remember those that acronym? Standard temperature and pressure is the first one. Um, scientists basically said way, way, way back when, we want to have a standard value that we just always do labs at. And they figured that they should always do labs at 101.325 kPas. And they figured they use zero degrees Celsius. So like if I told you do a lab under standard conditions, if I told some guy in Russia do a lab under standard conditions, this is what he would do. Maybe a Russian guy would have it easier to do work in zero degrees Celsius. Um, the problem with this is that zero degrees Celsius is an absolutely ridiculous temperature to work at. Such a poorly chosen number because you have to work at the freezing point all the time. Like how dumb was that? So standard ambient temperature and pressure is at 100 kilopascals and 25 degrees Celsius. Do you guys remember those numbers? Or at least talking about that? We typically try to work under standard ambient temperature pressure. Usually, I don't have the ability to manipulate pressure in the room. Pressure is usually what it is. Um, I mean, if you were working in a really high-tech lab, you probably could you know, seal the doors and try to change the pressure amount to be exactly what you wanted. So, um, sometimes if I give you a word problem involving this formula here, sometimes I'm just going to tell you it's an STP, and that just kind of implies two more numbers. So, does that make sense? Okay, uh, last topic then is today's topic. There's also a bunch of theory I need you guys to know regarding gases. And we've already kind of talked a bit about theory behind the gases. Today I just kind of want to rehash it. It's a good basically review lesson today. So, um, do you guys remember talking about vibrational, rotational, translational motion? Uh, basically the concept, I like this picture. To me, this picture helped me visualize what I know solids, liquids and gases look like. Solids being, I can't put my hand through a solid. Can we cut a solid? Yeah, I guess if you have a really sharp knife, you can separate particles. 
But really what you're doing is this set of particles and this set of particles, they're still all tightly combined together, right? And you just found a way to like separate them. Whereas liquids, liquids is a little bit more room in between the particles. There's not actually anything in that space, like in this area right here, or right here, or right here. There's not air in there. There's literally nothing inside between those particles. That makes sense? I guess technically sometimes water has a few air bubbles inside, but that's not what I'm talking about. Though. Whereas if this is a gas right here, again, same concept. This dead space right here, we call it a vacuum. There, there is nothing there. Okay. So gases have the ability to do all three of these in terms of motion. Uh, liquids vibrate and rotate, and solids just purely vibrate. Does that make sense? Um, I found this animated diagram here just to kind of maybe illustrate just the idea of what is happening to a gas within a container. Right. Do we see gases moving in front of us? Well, no. I mean, the gas particles are so far spread out that even if they had color to them, which, I mean, sometimes we'd argue maybe there really isn't a color to a lot of gases, uh, we really can't see them. But gas particles are moving all over the place. Right? And as a byproduct of that, they're going to hit the sides of the container. If they hit the sides of the container, that's going to be a force. Depending on how much force there is and how much area the container there is, that's pressure. Does that make sense? Like pressure is how much force molecules hit with over an area. Normally, we don't actually notice it because it's so small and negligible that we can't even tell that particles are hitting us. That being said, um, living in southern Alberta, we actually can sometimes feel some force because of the wind. Okay. Uh, pretty much the rest of my lesson then is just talking about a bunch of other properties of gases. Some of these we've mentioned before. Some of them I'm sure you know. Um, write them down somewhere. You're not great at memorizing stuff, but this is going to be like the theory section of your quiz tomorrow. So. Um, we've already talked about the term compressible, I believe, right? You guys know what that means? Like, because there's so much dead space between particles of a gas, you can squish them all in together and make a compressed gas. So when I think of a compressed gas, I think of like the, maybe like the propane in my uh, barbecue. Oh, there's a lot of gas in there. I think it's actually so compressed it starts turning into a liquid. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Like a highly compressed kind of thing? Uh, do you guys remember what diffuse means? Yeah, it has the ability to spread out. Um, if I were to um, like use a, I don't know, someone down the hallway, for example, sprays like a, a body spray or something like that, right? It doesn't just, those particles don't just linger right by that person's locker. They eventually spread out all the way down the hallway and then everyone can smell it. Does that make sense? So it diffuses the ability of these particles to move. Why can things diffuse? What property does gases have that other things don't? Their translational motion. Because gases have translational motion and they're capable of moving long distances, that means that the gases can diffuse and then spread out. Liquids can't diffuse because liquids don't actually have the ability to move from one location to another. They're kind of stuck where they are. They can slosh around, but like the water I have sitting in a cup is not going to end up on the other side of the world. But the gases I just finished breathing, they're going to move. Um, one more property, they fill their container. Uh, I want to make a couple notes on filling their container. Um, here's the container. I've got solid stuff inside the container. Is it filling the container up? Like, is it taking the shape of the container? Is this paper right here changing its shape? Okay. What if I put water inside? I would then argue that water actually also technically does fill the shape of its container. Because water has the ability to kind of form and mold itself. Does that make sense? So solids cannot fill their container. Like a solid, its shape is fixed. Liquids do fill their container, uh, but so do gases. Gases will also take the shapes of their container. So when I think of that, I think of like a balloon. Right? Like a balloon will, you know, like when I put gas into a balloon, it spreads out. And it makes it, you know, or whatever the shape of the balloon is. Does that make sense? No. Okay. Here's some more properties then. Again, I'm just kind of talking through them. Uh, if you increase temperature, gases expand. So that means they require more volume. If we go back to like um, the base reasons why, what really is temperature? That's like a measurement of 
heat, I guess, right? And uh, heat is a form of energy. And if you give particles more energy, that means that it increases their vibrational ability, it increases their rotational ability, but it also increases their translational motion. And I think I gave an analogy once before. If we had a bunch of like kindergarten kids and we gave them all Red Bull, they'd be pinging around the classroom, wouldn't they? I mean, even you guys would be, right? And so what would the kindergarten teacher want to do? She'd take her kids and she'd go outside and make them play in the playground. Does that make sense? If you give something more energy, it's going to want more space. So molecules move faster, therefore further apart. Um, okay, another one. Do you guys know the word viscosity from previous, I don't know, science classes? Um, viscosity basically just refers to how well can things, well, flow is the word I have using here. When I think of viscosity, I think of ketchup. You guys ever go to a restaurant and like they put ketchup in not, not like a squeeze bottle, but one of the glass bottles? You know, like you turn it upside down and the ketchup doesn't like come out of the bottle, so you gotta like hit the bottom of the bottle for it to come out. That's a, a, a viscosity. You know, the, the stickiness, if I use my fingers and quote it, right? Like, Things that have a high viscosity yeah, are, are able to, like, how do I put this here? Th things that have a high viscosity are not going to move very nicely. So, like, oil and sludge and molasses and syrup and ketchup, they have high viscosities. They're going to stick together a lot. Water flows very nicely. Does that make sense? Hence, we make water slides out of water because the water is going to go shooting down the water slide. If I made a water slide out of ketchup... Ignoring the fact that it would be gross, would you really slide down that water slide all that well? No. Does that make sense? Well, when we think of gases, um, air is even better than water is. So, like, for example, we use this property to heat our buildings. We use vents. Like, when I look at, like, these vents that are up top here, we can actually pump air from a central heating system or a central air conditioning system. And it's very easy to pump air throughout the building. Because air can flow very efficiently. Does that make sense? If we were trying to pump water through the whole building, that's still doable. right? And we do that with our sinks. We pump water, but that takes a little more work. Could we pump syrup throughout our whole building through vents? I mean, I don't know why you would. But like hypothetically, let's say you wanted to. It would be a lot harder to because it's way too sticky. It's way too thick. Does that make sense? So long story short, the property of gases is that they can flow very easily. So we can put gases into pipes, we can put gases into containers. And like, like I, when, I, when I say like a heating system, does that make sense? Previously when we wanted to heat buildings, we would have to put like an individual heater in each room. Right? Like when I think of like the 1900s, um, you'd have to have like a fire, a stove in every room to heat the house up, right? Well, now we just have one big furnace and we just pump the air to everywhere. Okay, uh, more properties. Gases are very low density. Uh, do you guys know what density is? It's similar to viscosity in a way that like it's how thick something is. Um, density, maybe I should make some side notes in case you've never worked with this before. Density actually has like a unit. The unit for density is how many grams you can shove in a milliliter. That's the unit for density. Um, do you guys know what like, some of the most dense substances we have on Earth are? There's one in particular we use to help shield us from x-rays. Nobody knows? What do they make you use at the dentist when like, they take x-rays of you? Yeah, they put like a lead vest over top of you. That's because lead is one of the most dense materials we know. By dense, I mean there is a whole lot of mass all shoved into a very small location. Does that make sense? Like if I were to draw a picture here, here is something that is not very dense at all. There are three molecules in that particular area. It's not really a lot. Here is something that is very dense. There are a lot of molecules all shoved together. That makes sense. Um, here, let me just try to go grab some manipulators. You guys can't see these particularly well, but this is aluminum. Aluminum is still a metal, so it is quite dense. 
but compared to other metals, aluminum is actually very not dense. It's one of the least dense metals we have. This metal right here weighs, um, I believe this is going to be 100 grams, and it requires that much metal to get you 100 grams. Does that make sense? This is lead, also a metal. This is also 100 grams. If you guys can see visually, like you'd need one, two, three, maybe four amounts of lead to be equivalent to what aluminum weighs. Does that make sense? Like, so they both weigh 100 grams, but this one is way more dense. There's a lot of mass shoved into this small little area. There's the exact same amount of mass here, but it doesn't take up as much area. Does that make sense? Okay. Anyways, gases are very non-dense. I mean, basically, they have that ability to spread out. And so if I wanted to have 100 grams of gas, here's 100 grams of lead. Here's 100 grams of aluminum. 100 grams of gas might require the whole room. Does that make sense? Because I mean, you're going to need a lot of gas to make it 100 grams. So. OK, uh, moving on. Gases have the ability to miss, mix. You guys know the word miscible? I think I've used it before. You OK? <laughs> Uh, gases have the ability to mix. Um, currently, we're breathing a concoction that's mostly nitrogen, partially oxygen. There's probably some carbon dioxide. There's probably some argon and krypton gas. Maybe there's some helium. Oh, does that make sense? But like, they're all interspersed evenly. And so, like, if we were talking about mixtures, it would be like a homogeneous mixture where we we wouldn't be able to see different layers. Sometimes that's not true. If it becomes particularly like smoggy, um, I think back, it's been a while. Do you guys remember the Beijing Olympics back in 2008? You guys remember that? There was a huge uproar back in 2008 because there was so much pollution in Beijing that uh, people didn't actually want to, like athletes were worried they were going to get sick from the amount of smog they were going to breathe. And there are like a lot of photos of just how bad the air pollution was in Beijing for the Olympics because you could actually see like some of the carbon dioxide gases, there were just that much of them that the composition of the atmosphere was changed. Yeah, so most of the time, like gases, you should not be able to see a difference. Like they're going to mix very nicely. Okay, that works so far. Are those all pretty straightforward things. Okay, uh, last couple slides then. Um, scientists have a few more properties that we want to add, but before I talk about these last couple properties, I want to add a couple definitions here. Um, the definitions are called real gases or ideal gases. <clears throat> I want to describe this. Um, a real gas is defined pretty much as like what gases typically do under normal conditions. Um, all the properties we just talked about, real gases will undergo those properties. I have a couple of properties that are that gases would have these abilities under ideal circumstances, but typically we can't get ideal circumstances. So these last couple properties are not always going to be true. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So these are properties that are only occasionally true just under the right circumstances. So here are some properties of ideal gases. So not always true, but we'd like to hope that they normally are under regular everyday circumstances. So here's property one. Gas molecules should always be in constant random motion. Ideally, this should be true. And truth be told, most gases we look at are always moving. They're always randomly bumping into each other and moving around. But there are certain conditions in which they're not actually going to do this. Okay. Anyone have any idea what condition might make it so that gases stop moving? Really cold. I mean, we're talking almost to the point of absolute zero, where the gases are no longer really gases. We get it so cold that they turn into liquids, and maybe even solids at that point. Does that make sense? So maybe something you want to put as a side note here is that, yeah, normally, ideally, gases will do this. Okay. However, a real gas would exist at, like, say, 4 degrees Kelvin. And then a real gas would not actually really be a gas anymore. It would not, the molecules would not be moving in a straight line. They wouldn't be, you know, moving randomly. They're probably going to start sticking together and acting like a solid. Does that make sense? So ideally, gases should always move. However, it is possible that if we change the conditions so extreme that this property is not true. 
my second property. Um, gases are considered to be point masses. Um, I'm going to go back in my slides just to a picture, the very, very first picture on the slide. This one I'll do here. here. Here's a bunch of gas particles sitting inside there, and there's, there's dead space everywhere else. Right? Um, those gas particles, if I keep squishing more and more gas particles, should I be able to compress that gas more and more? And I would say, yeah, for sure. You can keep shoving more and more in. However, is there eventually going to be a point where there is no more room inside the container? And I would say, yeah, eventually you'd reach a point where all of those gas particles are so closely shoved together that the actual size of the individual particle starts to matter. Does that make sense? Where like normally gas particles are so small that we don't actually consider the size of the particle. Like all of these particles are drawn about that big. But what if there was a particle that was actually only that big? Well then you could fit more, you could fit more of them inside. Does that make sense? So the idea behind a point mass is that although there is mass, like each individual gas particle must weigh something, it's so small in terms of its volume that it's really considered to be negligible. However, there would be a condition where the actual size of the particle itself would matter. Anybody have any idea what that condition might be? Exceptionally high pressure. If you were to pressurize a gas so much and throw so much gas inside, there's such high pressure, eventually would the gas really act like a gas anymore? I'd say, well, it probably wouldn't act like a gas. It would act more like a solid because there are so many gas particles shoved inside a container that do they have the ability to move around like normally you'd expect a gas to do? I'd say, well, no. How, how are they going to move? There's so many gas particles shoved inside. Uh, if you take this room, for example, and imagine that each of you is a gas particle, does the actual size of you really make that much of a difference in the room? Like, can you move around the room freely? Now, if we were all 700 pound sumo wrestlers, now maybe it's making a bit of an issue. Does that make sense? But for the most part, we're all of a fairly relatively small size compared to the room. That being said, what if we put 900 of us inside here? Well, now it's gonna be kind of squishy. Does that make sense? But what if we weren't our size? What if we were all Kinsey Ann's size? So my daughter is even yay high. Well, now we could fit more of us inside. Does that concept make sense there? So ideally, you would consider that the actual volume of the molecule, like not the volume of the container, but the volume of the actual individual molecule, normally that's irrelevant because really that size is so small, except under exceptionally high pressure. If you put a lot of molecules and shove them all in, there's so much pressure. Now, now, it would, now it would matter. Uh, third property, have you guys ever heard the term uh, kinetic energy before? Have you guys done that in physics? Is that something you guys are familiar with? Anybody know what the formula for kinetic energy is? It's not relevant to this. It's uh, one half of mv squared. You don't need to know that. But you guys have heard of kinetic energy before though? Like it's the energy of motion? Um, all particles, regardless of where they are, should have some energy in the form of vibrating or rotating or translating. Okay. Um, kinetic energy should become conserved. Like all, always energy should be conserved. I want to go back to this diagram, that I, the, the, the slide that happens here. All of these particles here have energy of some type. And as you look around, sometimes it moves a little faster and sometimes a particle is going to move a little slower. There was a particle sitting right about here at the very end of that where it almost wasn't even <coughs> moving anymore. Let's see if I can find it. You can see how this red one right here is hardly moving at all. Oh, now it starts going faster and starts pinging around. Does that make sense? Collectively, if we look at all of the energy of all of the molecules, it should be like that total amount of energy should be the same. Because if this guy's moving slow and this guy hits him, then this guy moves slow and that guy moves faster. Does that make sense? Ideally, that should happen. But again, there are a couple of conditions which would make it so that this wouldn't be true. If you made it really cold, for example, and we went back to 5 degrees Kelvin again, where it's nearly absolute zero, are these molecules going to have enough energy to really bounce off of each other in a nice sort of way? I'd say, well, no, they probably won't at that point. Now they might hit each other and like stick together instead. And by sticking together, they will, they will no longer be gases. If they start sticking together, they'll start becoming liquids. And if more of them start sticking together, they'll start becoming solids. 
That makes sense. As, as they would lose energy due to like extreme cold temperatures, kinetic energy would not be conserved. And then one last thing here, uh, molecules should never attract or repel each other. Um, most gases that we know of are all fairly small molecules. Uh, for example, if we look at like the periodic table over here, as elements, gases are things like neon, argon, oxygen, nitrogen. All of those things should, um, they should not have a charge to them. They should all be neutral molecules. So there's no reason for them to stick together. If particles actually stuck together, they would no longer be gases. They'd become liquids. Yeah. Uh, but there again, there is a problem. Molecules will start to attract and stick to each other if you have particles that are very, very cold. Does that make sense, by the way? The idea that that's what makes something a liquid or a solid is remove its energy, and this molecule and this molecule, which we're really far apart, they now start sticking together, making liquids and solids. This last slide basically just summarizes it. Um, real gases then occur under normal conditions. So like the gases we talk about are real gases. However, there are some conditions and it usually involves a very large pressure or very low temperature where sometimes these things no longer act like they should. And so those properties only happen under ideal conditions. Uh, basically, that's my lesson then. So I just need you guys to know a bunch of different um, properties. It's not just memorize the properties, though, because that's not what I'm going to ask you on a test. You're going to now need to be able to know those properties and use them to interpret a theory question. So it's, there's going to be like a higher level thinking skill than just knowing them. So make sure at the very least you know those properties. Any questions? Okay, I feel like I talk really a lot. Um, the rest of the class is your guys' is to work on whatever it is you want to. I would say in terms of priority, make sure you work on your lab and your assignment. Um, if you're not working on labs and assignments before we do tests, you're doing it in the wrong order. Like I purposely designed the questions in my labs and the questions on my assignments to be the types of questions you also get on your tests. So like if you're trying to do tests first and then assignments and labs, you're probably not doing as well as you'd like to. I would say those are the two main things. Uh, one last thought. If you're interested in doing a research project, um, how, for those of you who did research projects, did I ask somebody how long did it take you guys? You said it was about six, seven hours. I would say, I mean, if, if that is a worthwhile investment of your time, if you have time to do it, I think that learning how to do research is a worthwhile skill to have. And I would also say that anytime you can practice writing, it's probably good, because it won't necessarily help here as much, but you've got to help your English and social marks the more you write. But I'd say the same thing as last unit. If you don't want to do the research project, that's absolutely fine by me. If you want to kind of leave it until the end of the unit and discover, okay, I need a, I need a better mark to help my grades. Let's so say a couple of you guys that probably helped your mark quite a bit by doing the research project. You're nodding your head. so. Anyways, those are the main three things. Research project, lab, assignment. Sound good? All right, uh, you guys can take a break if you want, then you have 45 minutes to do stuff. So.